the intervening river course prevented our trying any of the more southerly uh, tunnels on this trip. And indeed, if both the neighboring ones had, were choked, it would, was doubtful whether our batteries would warrant an attempt on the next northerly one, about a mile beyond our second choice. As we threaded our dim way through the labyrinth with the aid of the map and compass, traversing rooms and corridors in every stage of ruin and preservation, clambering up ramps, crossing the upper floors and bridges, and clambering down again, encountering choked doorways and piles of debris, hastening now and then along finally preserved and uncannily immaculate stretches, taking false leads and retracing our way in such cases removing the blind paper trail where we had left, and once in a while striking down the bottom of an open shaft through which daylight poured or trickled down, we were repeatedly tantalized by the sculptured walls along our route. Many must have told tales of immense historical importance and only the prospect of later visits reconciled us to the need of passing them by. As it was, we slowed down once in a while and turned on our second torch. If we had had more films, we would certainly have paused briefly to photograph certain bar reliefs, but time-consuming hand-copying was clearly out of the question. I come now once more to a place where temptation to hesitate or to hint rather than state is very strong. It is necessary, however, to reveal the rest in order to justify my course in discouraging further exploration. We had wormed our way very close to the computed site of the tunnel's mouth, having crossed the second story bridge to what seemed plainly the tip of a pointed wall and descended to the ruinous corridor, especially rich in decadently elaborate and apparently ritualistic sculptures of late workmanship. When about 8.30 p.m., Dan Ford's keen young nostrils gave us the first hint of something unusual. If we had had a dog with us, I suppose we would have been warm before. At first, we could not precisely say what was wrong with the formerly crystal pure air. But after a few seconds, our memories reacted only too definitely. Let me try to state the thing without flinching. There was an odor, and that odor was vaguely, subtly, and unmistakably akin to what had nauseated us upon opening this insane grave of the horror poor Lake Kent dissected. Of course, the res revelation was not as clearly cut as time as it sounds now. There were several conceivable explanations, and we did a good deal of indecisive whispering. Most important of all, we did not retreat without further investigation. For having come this far, we were loath to be balked by anything short of a certain disaster. Anyway, we must have been suspected was altogether too wild to believe. Such things did not happen in the world. It was too probably sheer irrational instinct which made us dim our single torch, tempted no longer by the decadent and sinister sculptures that leered menacingly from the oppressive walls, and which softened our prog progress to a cautious tiptoeing and crawling over the increasingly littered floor of, in heaps of debris. Danforth's eyes, as well as nose, proved better than mine, for it was likewise that he'd first noticed the queer aspect of the debris after we passed many half-choked arches, leading to chambers and corridors on the ground level. It did not look quite as ought, ought, as it ought after countless thousands of years of desertion, and when we cautiously turned on one more light, we saw the, a kind of swath seemed to have been lately tracked through it. The irregular 
nature of the litter precluded any definite marks, but in the smoother places there were suggestions of the dragging of heavy objects. Once we thought there was a hint of parallel tracks as if runners, this was made, made us pause again. It was during that pause that we caught simultaneously this time the other order ahead. Paradoxically, it was both a less frightful and a more frightful order. Less frightful intrinsically, but infinitely appalling in this place under the known circumstances. Unless, of course, Gedney... For the odor was the plain and familiar one of common petrol, everyday gasoline. Our motivation after that is something I will leave to psychologists. We knew now that some terrible extension of the Camp Horrors must have crawled into this nighted burial place of eons. Hence could not doubt any longer of the existence of nameless conditions, present or at least recent, just ahead. Yet in the end we did let sheer burning curiosity or anxiety or auto-hypnotism or vague thoughts of responsibility toward Gedney, or whatnot, drive us one. Danforth whispered again of the print he thought he'd seen at the alley turning in the ruins above, and of the faint musical piping, potentially of tremendous significance in the light of Wake's dissection report. Despite its close resemblance to the cave mouth echoing of the Windy Peaks, which he thought he had shortly afterward heard, half heard from unknown depths below. I, in my turn, whispered of how the camp was left, of what had disappeared, and of how the madness of a lone survivor must might have conceived the inconceivable. A wild trip across the mount, monstrous mountains and the descent into the unknown pile masonry. But we could not convince each other, even ourselves, of anything definite. We turned off all light as we stood still, and vaguely noticed that a trace of deeply filtered upper day kept the blackness from absolute. Having automatically begun to move ahead, we guided ourselves by occasional flashes from our torch. The disturbed debris form an impression we could not shake off, and the smell of gasoline grew stronger. More and more ruin met our eyes and hampered our feet until very soon we saw that the forward way was about to cease. We had been to all too correct in our pessimistic guess about that rift glimpsed from the air. Our tunnel quest was a blind one. I and mean, we're not even going to be able to reach it until the, the basement out of which the abyss word aperture opened. The torch flashing it over the grotesquely carbon walls of the black corridor in which we stood showed several doorways and various states of obstruction and from one of them the gasoline odor Quite submerging that other hint of odor came in with a special distinctness. As we looked more steadily, we saw that beyond a doubt there had been a slight and recent clearing of the debris from that particular opening. Whatever the lurking horror might be, we believe the direct avenue toward it was mainly now plainly manifest. I do not think anyone will wonder that we waited an appreciable time before making any further motion. And yet when we did venture into that black arch, our first impression was one of anticlimax. For amidst the littered expanses of that sculptured crypt, a perfect cube from with sides about 50, 20 feet, 
there remained no recent object of instantly discernible size, so that we looked instinctively, though in vain, for a, a farther doorway. In another moment, however, Danforth's sharp vision had described a place where the floor debris had been disturbed. And we turned on both torches to full strength. So what we saw in that light was actually simple and trifling. I'm nonetheless reluctant to tell of it because of what it implied. It was a rough leveling of debris upon which several small objects lay carelessly scattered and at one corner of which a considerable amount of gasoline must have been spilled lately enough to leave a strong odor even in this extreme super plateau at altitude. In other words, it could not be other than a sort of camp. A camp made by questing beings who, like us, had been turned back by the unexpectedly choked way to the abyss. <laughs> Let me be plain. The scattered objects were, so far as substance for us concerned, all from Blake's camp, and consisted of tin cans as clearly open as those we have seen at the rapture place. Many spent batches, three illustrated books are more or less curiously smudged, an empty big ink bottle with its pictorial and instructional card, a broken fountain pen, and some oddly snipped fragments of fur and tent a used electric battery with circular of directions. A folder that came with our type of tent heater and a sprinkling of purple papers. It was all bad enough, but when we smoothed out the papers and looked at what was on them, we felt we'd come to the worst. We found certain inexplicably blotted papers at the camp which might have prepared us Yet the effect of the sight down here in the pre-human vaults of the Nightmare City was almost too much to bear. A mad Gedney might have made these groups of, of dots in imitation of those found in the greenish soapstones, just as the dots on those insane five-pointed grave mounts might have been made. And he might conceivably have prepared rough, hasty sketches, varying in, in their accuracy or lack of it, which outlined the neighboring parts of the city and traced their way from the circularly represented place outside our previous room. A place we identified as Great Cylindrical Tower and the carvings and as vast of circular gulf glimpsed in our aerial survey. To the present five-pointed structure right in tunnel mouth therein. He might, I repeat, have prepared such sketches, but for those before us, quite obviously compiled as our own, had been from late sculptures somewhere in the glacial labyrinth, though not from the ones we had seen and used. But what this art blind bunker could have never have done was to execute those sketches in a strange and assured technique perhaps superior, despite haste and carelessness to any of the decadent carvings with which we were, they were taken. The characteristic and unmistakable technique to all the ones themselves in the dead city's heyday. There are those who will say Danforth and I were utterly mad not to flee for our lives after that, since where our conclusions were now notwithstanding their wildness, completely fixed and of a nature I need not even mention to those who have read my accounts as far as, far as this. Perhaps we were mad, for I have not said those powerful peaks were mountains of madness. But I think I can detect something of the same spirit, albeit in the less extreme form, and the men who stalk deadly beasts through African jungles to photograph them or study their habits. Half paralyzed with terror, though we were, that we would never, nevertheless fan within us a blazing flame of awe and curiosity which triumphed in the end. <laughs>